My name is Brian Pollock. I'm a senior applications engineer. Uh, I've been doing this stuff for around 14 years now. Um, and what we want to do is we want to take you on a journey today um, and try to uh, try to get you to think like a tech support, put you on this side of the fence. Um, we're going to show you some tricks and techniques that will help you uh, figure out what's going on inside of your models. First and foremost, I start every presentation asking a simple question. Do you dread working with large assemblies? And I hear the other sigh over the silent webcast. Right? This is a, I know the reaction from every presentation. I give this presentation multiple times a year, and the reaction is always the same. Maybe you've seen a few of these. I know I've seen one or two of them. So these messages come up quite often and know the stress level, right? These are frustrating, we're stressed out, we don't like seeing these, and our goal is to take you from this level of stress down to this level. So the first thing we ask is what's, what do we do? Well, the first thing we do when we're having these problems. So when we're working large assemblies, the first thing we do is we try to replicate the issue on another PC. Okay. So when you're working uh, on troubleshooting, when you're working on tech support, it's a process of elimination. Okay. We're trying to see if the issue that you're experiencing happens on another machine. And what that will tell us is that the issue is specific to the data, so it travels with the data set. Or is the issue specific to your working environment, your machine? Right. You might uh, vent to another coworker. Often a few choice words might come out, you know, so um, be forewarned. Uh, probably our favorite is uh, perform a little percussive maintenance. Okay. Uh, we, we commonly advise that you avoid that person's cubicle for your own safety. Okay. Um, objects might come flying out at you. But most importantly, right, you need to contact your VAR. We do see these problems every day. So we're going through this stuff on a regular basis. Uh, we see these problems quite often. Okay. We like to think that we're good listeners. All right, we're going to hear you out. We're going to be somebody to let you vent. Okay. And after you're done venting, we may even solve your issue. However, I'm here today because what if you can solve your own problem? So let's take you through a case study. This is a customer of ours, a company called Chipstar. Uh, they are uh, located out in Oregon. And uh, just one of the many customers that caught contact us on a regular basis. And they reached out to us and their frustration level was very high because they've hit the point where their assembly would no longer open. It's a common story. It was fine yesterday, I opened it today, and it doesn't work. So what do we gotta do? 
So from the tech support side, I've got to interrogate your data set. So I'm going to get your data. Now, I don't know anything about your files, but we're going to interrogate the data, and I'm going to learn about your files. i got to get the files open, right? So that's the whole goal is to get the files open in SOLIDWORKS. Once the files are open, we've got to identify the problematic files. Okay. What is causing the issue? Once I've identified the problem, okay, now we start cleaning up the problem. And once I've cleaned it up, we circle all the way back around, and we should be able to open up the improved assembly and get better performance. So this assembly came in as a 238-meg zip file. There were 73 assemblies, 453 parts. But again, I don't know anything about your assemblies. I don't know anything about your models. Okay, And how do we find this information? Well, it's simple. I get this out of pack and go. Okay. When I run a pack and go, it's going to tally up, and it's going to tell me how many part files, how many assembly files, and how many, uh, how many drawing files? The next thing I'm going to do, once I got the files, I'm going to extract them out, and I'm going to use Windows. Windows is going to give me some information about your files. Okay. One of the first tricks, uh, a lot of Windows, straight up Windows techniques, uh, is I'm going to sort the data. So I'm going to open up Windows Explorer. And we know that you can click on a column in, in the Windows Explorer and sort by that column. So I could, I could sort by the name, I could sort by the file type, I could sort by the size. Okay. But were you aware that we can actually do a sort by multiple columns? Okay. So I can sort this by the assembly types. Now alphabetically sort my assemblies and then my part files. All right. And if I had drawing files, they'd be mixed in there as well. And I'm going to simply hold down the shift key and click on a second column. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to sort by the type. Then I'm going to hold the shift key and I'm going to sort by the size. What that does for me is it sorts all my assemblies. It puts them from largest to smallest. And as I scroll down in my list, I get down to the part documents, and then they start from largest to smallest. Okay. Uh, so a very convenient way that I don't have to look at all of them uh, in one uh, overall sort, uh, but I can look uh, inside of each grouping of part types. And that's just a straight up Windows command. Uh works in, in uh inside the Windows Explorer. Uh very importantly, uh we uh we get files all the time. And we gotta figure out what version the file is. Right? We all know that you can't work uh and can't open the file in a newer version. Um because once it's opened in a newer version and saved, we cannot go backwards. So in 2015, SOLIDWORKS gave us a couple options uh, inside the Explorer window to add a couple additional columns. So we can go into our Windows Explorer and right click on my columns and go down to more. And if you scroll way down in the list, you're going to find the SW last saved with and the SW opening times. If you check those boxes, uh, they will add additional columns. And right inside of my Windows Explorer, I can take a look at uh, the file that these uh, were saved with. Okay. 
But once again, I don't know anything about your data. I've never seen it. What's important there is, too, now I can use my sorting and I can sort by the last saved with. Um, and very easily I can see um, what version files I have in here. So a majority of these files are 2016. Uh, looking at my list here, I do have some 2015 files. Um, and if I do the sort, I actually go back and we have files all the way back to 2012. So if you close Windows Explorer, keep coming back into that uh, folder, you're gonna lose those columns. So we can actually save that setting so that those columns stick, and I don't have to turn them on every time. And to do that, we're simply going to go into the Windows Explorer options, right? find the Change Folder and Search options. And on the View tab, we're going to click the button to apply to the folders. Okay. And that way, those columns stay inside of Windows Explorer. Anytime I browse into my Windows Explorer, those columns will be shown um, and we don't have to keep setting that up. Very, very handy feature, especially on the tech support. We get files from customers uh, all the time. Uh, we've got customers ranging in all different versions. Um, so I know our support team uses that function uh, day in and day out. Uh, helps us uh, make sure that we know exactly what version we need to edit files in. Next thing I'm going to do is we're going to turn on the file preview. So inside of Windows Explorer, when I'm in my folder, I'm going to turn on my preview pane. Right? We can drag that out, get a nice large preview. And I can start clicking on my files. And I can look at the thumbnail images. So now I can go through this and I can get a pretty good idea of what type of files I'm dealing with. Okay. Now I said there's 450 some odd parts. This is gonna take me a while to scroll through all these files. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to my view options and I'm gonna turn on my thumbnails, large, extra large, all right, a lot of this depends on how big of a screen you're dealing with. Um, and now I can get you know, four or five rows of pictures um, on my screen at one time. And I can scroll through the images and very quickly, all right, we got a lot of fasteners in here. Let me get some Geometric parts, some rectangles, triangular geometry, right? Nothing, uh, nothing too scary, nothing too complex. Got some gears in here. Things that jump out to me. If I'm scrolling through this, I got images, and then I get a generic file. Right? I get a generic thumbnail. Okay, what's going on with that file? Lots of fasteners. All right, so very easily, very quickly, we scroll through here. All right. Again, nothing, uh, nothing real complex. No organic shapes uh, causing real complex geometries. No complex surfacing going on here. All right. So everything, uh, which makes sense, this is a pretty, uh, pretty basic machine uh, design part. Right. But I've got a pretty good sense of what's going on. So now I know how many files we have, I know what versions we have, I know what the geometry looks like, but I don't know anything about your data. Okay. Now the problem was we couldn't open the data. So the first thing we gotta do, right? I've collected some data, I've got some idea of what's going on, right? You guys will know your own files. 
but now I got to get this file open. And we do that with the file open dialog. Okay, and down at the bottom, we're going to take a look at two of the pull down options right, the mode and the configurations. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the different modes. So, we got four different modes we got resolve, which, which brings in all the geometry, brings in all the information. We got lightweight. Lightweight is going to keep some of the featured data uh, out of the RAM. Okay. Uh, large assembly mode uh, by default kicks in at 500 components. All right. Uh, it's going to turn off some more functions. And you got large design review, which is um, by, by default used at 5,000 components all right, and is opening the model in a graphic format. So the whole idea is to find a method that opens the model. Now we're not going to walk through these. I'm not going to make you guys watch that. All right, but we marched through and looked at each one of these. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at configurations. Every model has a default configuration. So we have one configuration um, automatically. I want to take a look and see if there's any other configurations in these files. If there is, that's the first thing I want to do, is I want to switch and try to open a different configuration. Many times, files won't open because of a rebuild issue. A rebuild gets hung state, something happens. So if I can open and force the model into a different configuration, I can rebuild the models. And once I rebuild the models, many times, we're able to go back to that original configuration and get it open. Once I have that all open, we get the data saved, and off we go. 2020, they changed this dialog just a little bit, right? So they give us resolve, lightweight, large design review. And then uh, they got a couple check boxes for large assembly settings, uh, speed pack, and hidden components. And then off on the right, we still have our configuration pull down. So they just changed the layout. The functions are all still there. And actually, they add a couple more to, to uh, help us out. If that doesn't work, okay. what we see here under the configurations down at the bottom, there's this advanced option. Okay. So if I select advanced and hit open, another dialog box is going to come up for us. First option says, well, open the selected configuration. Okay, great. Second option says, open a new configuration showing all of the reference models. So that, that's telling us how it's to open up everything uh, that's listed in the tree. Okay, that gets pretty cumbersome. I don't know what uh, is doing that. So the, the one we like to use is this third option. Create a new configuration showing only the assembly structure. So I'm going to give it a config name. So testing, open for testing, junk, anything you want. Okay. And what that's going to do is show me the feature tree with everything suppressed. All right. Again, my challenge is just to get into the file at this point. If I choose that option, this is what my tree is going to look like. Okay. Actually, you're going to see that it doesn't even show me the, the assembly folders, the origin, the planes. Right? It just shows me the list of components in this part. When I get to this point, now I'm in the file. I got it open. Now I'm going to start unsuppressing components. I'm going to go one by one. I'm going to select the first and work from the top down. And now, again, I don't know anything about your files, but now I get an insight to how this assembly got put together. Okay, so we start with the bottom frame. We added a vertical wall structure. Okay. So we can go one by one. We can go with groups of full files. We just don't want to go in a chunk uh, that's super huge, 
Uh, I don't want to do half the tree at a time. Because as I keep unsuppressing things, I'm waiting for this to fail. And as I keep going, right, we come across our first error. Okay. So it comes up, it says, unable to locate these files. All right, so he did a pat and go, sent me everything. But a couple of these did not come over. This one was pretty easy uh, because it actually tells me the entire path. Looking for this lock washer. Um, but if we notice, where is this path? In some app data local temp weird folder directory. Okay. So it's in some temp directory. Okay. So I was able to take these paths, email them back to the customer, say, hey, I'm missing these files. And guess what? He went right to that location. He was able to find those files, send them over to me. All right, so we continue on. And we keep walking through this. And eventually, right, I'm looking for the file that crashes. I'm looking the file won't open, errors out. All right. And if it if it happens within a subassembly and the model crashes, then I'm going to begin this entire process over starting at that subassembly. And we're going to drill down into that subassembly and do the same thing. We're going to keep looking for the file causing the error. Many, many, many times. I go through these assemblies, and it can be one single component that has a rebuild issue buried down in a subassembly that causes the whole thing not to open. So if I can drill down, find that component, get it open, rebuild it, I can often then open the higher level assemblies. We use that technique quite often to help us narrow and drill down to the files causing the problem. So what other tools can we use? Now is open, we're going to use our assembly visualization. So when we're opening, one of the things that we often look at is older version files. We've all seen the message, all the version files will be uh, converted when the file is saved. But why is that important to us? Okay. Older version files are slower to open. Okay. Every time you open a file, SOLIDWORKS updates the header information within the file, okay. tells some conversion, and opens. So every time you open that older file, it has to go through that process. Once that file is saved, it no longer has to do that when it's opening the models. Some of you may remember back in 2015, SOLIDWORKS actually changed how it compresses the data within our files. Okay. And during that period, we actually saw as much as 50, even 70% file size reduction. Okay. So they they changed the compression that made it harder for competitors to get inside and get the data out of our files, right? So they updated that. So anything that is pre-2015 is now in the old format. It's in the old file format, all right? So, so that's why it's important to look at those old versions. Uh, there is a batch conversion tool inside the task scheduler. Okay. Um, can run, it's going to basically open the file, save it, close it, and go to the next file. Uh, we often say do those on projects that you are working on, because as you convert data, uh, the common, uh, common story that we come across in tech support is always that it was good in the old version, something changed, right? So uh, if you're not looking at your files, looking at your data, we're not going to know if something uh, converted funny, or if there's any issues when we go through that data. So I always advise that to make sure you're looking at those assemblies, we bring them up to the new version, everything's still good for you. Now, 
In 2020, we have a new function here. There's a new system option that says we no longer need to update all the files to the major version. Okay. So from the sports side, performance side, we're still trying to understand how this impacts us. Okay. But there is an option that says I can open up my assembly and it is only going to save any files that have been modified. It's not going to save all of the reference documents to the newest version. So development says they've figured out an algorithm uh, that allows us to do that. And uh, they, they say the performance is still uh, pretty much the same. All right, digging deeper into this assembly, all right, this was uh, quite the uh, blooming onion for us. Uh, every time I peeled back a layer, found one thing or another in here, this got better and better, okay? So digging deeper, we found education files, okay? This is a big no-no, okay? We do not want education files in production environment. It, it's going to watermark your entire assembly. So one education file will watermark every file in your assembly as educational. Okay. How do you find those? Well, you can find them by the little graduation cap, right? Little graduation cap in the uh, feature tree um, indicates that it's an education version. Um, how do we get these? Well, the idea is that we don't want to be getting students uh, using education versions doing production work, education files are for education, for learning the software, okay? DOWNWORKS uh, does not let us easily go through and just wipe those off, right? It, it, they do make that it, quite the uh, painful process with many different sign-offs, right? So if you find one or two files, you're gonna be faster recreating that file. Okay, so definitely be careful. A lot of people do come across these you go out and download a file from the web, okay? Uh, lots, of, lots of people post files out there. Make sure you know what you're grabbing. So in the assembly visualization tool, right, it's found on the assembly toolbar. This uh, utility allows us to look at many, many factors inside of SOLIDWORKS. So, we can look at quantities, mass properties, surface bodies. Um, and what we like to do, we like to look at something called graphic triangles. So I'm gonna change my columns inside the assembly visualization by clicking that little black triangle on the right edge there and going into my options and finding the graphic triangles. So it's very simple performance. The more triangles in a part, the slower the performance. All right, so this list is dynamic. So if I sort by my graph triangles, I can have all of my largest counts up at the top of my list. And it gives me a great starting point to finding the problematic files. So the components that come to the top of the list are the components that have the highest impact on my performance. Now this graphic triangle column is per part. So I also have to take into consideration the quantity column. As I look at these, uh, we look for complex geometries. We look for things with helical cuts, such as a helical cut thread. We look for helical springs. I look for internal helical cut. All right, so these all have a common theme. All right, helicals. Helicals are one of the most complex functions that we perform inside of SOLIDWORKS. They create lots of 
triangle counts, lots of sliver faces, uh, and and run up the geometry counts. Okay, so looking at the top components in our model, uh, one of the first ones we came across is leaf spring. Okay. Well, let's go into SOLIDWORKS here and take a look at this file. See how we can uh, fix it. One of the first things we do, I always go into my system options, and I take a look at the document properties. And we look at the image quality. Okay, so the image quality represents the number of lines that we use to make a circle. So all the way down at our lowest setting, a circle looks like a hexagon. And what we find is we're all the way over here on the right end. So once again, if I go all the way down, very few entities in that circle, it looks like a hexagon. As I move to the right, we start adding more lines. As I add more lines, right when I get about here, between this third and fourth tick mark, Right, this represents this is 20%. Okay, that circle looks good enough. The further I go to the right, the lower my deviation between lines gets. All right, the truer that circle looks. This is strictly graphics. Okay, it has nothing to do with the calculation. If I take that slider and I go all the way into this red zone, okay, this is like going at a high definition. Sliding into the red zone will cause file sizes to increase, graphic performance to decrease, and increase uh, memory usage. Now, we have this red zone and we have these little black triangles. Okay, The danger zone is actually this black triangle. I have many, many people that come all the way up here, put their cursor right about there, and say, well, I'm not in the red zone. I don't know why these two don't match up, but if you're in this black triangle, you're in the high quality zone, the danger zone. Okay. File size increase. When we have seen uh, two meg files become 18 megs, uh, I had a 30 meg assembly become 430 megs. Okay. Uh, that was another uh, case where the customer couldn't open it. We got their assembly, we came in, we took this slider, Dragged it down, closed it, and opened the assembly. It was uh, strictly they could no longer, their hardware could not uh, open the file because it ballooned, and it was strictly the image quality. So that's the first thing we do. We come in, we drop that down. And that alone is going to significantly decrease our trial count. But I have to ask myself, is that good enough? All right. Or can we do better? So if I take a cross section of this part and we look at our geometry, I've got all this circular geometry on the inside and outside of my part. Okay, so that's a lot of triangles, a lot of geometry that has to be calculated. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go in and create a simplified configuration of this. Now, it's very key when we do this that we cr create a standard naming convention and use that every time. All right, so I'm going to call it simplified. Um, I'm going to spell it the same way, capitalize it the same way, right? So create my simplified configuration. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to create some sketches. This is right up my top plane. I'm going to create two circular sketches. The first one, we're going to come just inside that interior wall. And the second one, I'm going to drag it out so that we're about, you know, about 80% of the way through the wall. I'm going to create an extrude. And this extrude, the key here is to have it merge. I'm going to merge my results. I'm going to bring this all the way up to that first ring. 
just so that it doesn't break through. And on the other end, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to go all the way down to the other end, just far enough that it doesn't break all the way through. When I merge that all together, okay, it still looks like a spring. But if I take a look at my cross section, this is where we see the benefit. See, as I merge that together, now all this interior geometry that was all a series of round curves is now one straight cylinder. And I don't have to calculate that geometry. But on the outside of my part, I still get the benefit of a spring. Okay. This works uh, very good on uh, condensed springs. Now I could uh, get rid of the curve, the helix all the way around just draw a cylinder, that would be great, that'd be even better, right? But if I am trying to preserve some of the look, this is a great little trick uh, to, uh, to get some much, much better performance. Next file I came across. Uh, once again, many, many of these files um, our tech team certainly knows the naming convention. Uh, we can look at the part file name. We all know the source of these files. Uh, this is a, uh, a thumb screw downloaded from Big Master Car. Big Master has a great library of components, all right, but they do have a lot of detail in their components. So we got a full helical thread, and we've got a knurled grip. cut into the uh, into the top of the part here. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna come in here. I'm gonna simplify this geometry. And McMaster files are pretty easy because the first thing to get rid of these threads, right? Um, they have a helical sweep, uh, helical uh, feature and a cut sweep uh, with most of their thread features. So I can suppress that and get rid of the threaded cut. Now the neural uh, was an extruded cut and a circular pattern. Okay. So I got rid of those and I put a thread decal right, to represent the thread on my shaft. And for the knurled grip, um, I found a chain link uh, decal, uh, which allows me to have that same diamond pattern. Okay. And so from a distance, we can easily determine that that is indeed a thumb screw. Okay. Now, what that does is this makes one solid cylinder. All right, drops that graph count, and I don't have all of those little indented cuts, those small sliver faces uh, raising the cuts. Graphics, decals, graphics are our friends. They add no geometry to the part. Okay. And once again, that one, uh, in fact, was up in the red zone. And what we have noticed is, in fact, any file you download from McMaster is going to be defaulted all the way up in the red zone. Okay, so not only are they uh, very high detail-oriented parts, they are defaulted in this red zone. And they want to give you the best looking part they can. All right, but that is impacting us on our performance end. Uh, continuing on, uh, next file we found, um, pipe nipples, okay, uh, machine design parts, so we got some pipe nipples, again, helical threads on both ends, all right, defaulted all the way up in the red zone. So again, we drop the image quality, suppress these threads, and um, drop some decals on the end, uh, and give us that threaded look. Uh, fasteners. Uh, this assembly had more than 40 different fasteners uh, that it used. 
uh, most of which had a helical thread on them. Uh, this particular um, component uh, was used 40 times in the assembly. Okay. Uh, so once again, we're going to simplify that, get rid of that thread, throw a decal on there, drop the image quality. Again, using that same simplified, and if you're not sure how to add a configuration, it's simply just done by a right-click, Add Configuration. And configurations are simply just suppressing and unsuppressing uh, controlling features in the tree. Keep in mind, fasteners in an assembly are placeholders. We want them in the assembly. We want them in the bill material. We all take fasteners, and we stick them in a block. We don't see all that threaded detail, yet every time you rotate your assembly, you have to generate and calculate all of those threads. Okay, so flexible subassemblies. All right, this is another area that we find. Um, you can you can identify it by the uh, icon in the tree. The little uh, block is up off at an angle. Okay. So overall, our goal is to minimize the number of top level mates. We want to keep that as low as reasonable. So if we do everything um, to minimize top level mates, we can create sub assemblies push mates down into those sub-assembly components, and those are calculated differently, okay? So we calculate those mates uh, different than we do at the top level. Uh, we can use component patterns, right? But when you push things into sub-assemblies, they're rigid. They can't move. And sometimes we want to see the whole thing, different sub-assemblies moving with the top level components. When you go and set your assembly to be flexible, allow it to move. We are taking all of those mates that we pushed out of the top level, and we're now pulling them back up and solving them at the top level. So in this example here, we had 171 top level mates. Okay. But with the assembly, uh, flexible sub-assemblies, we had uh, an additional 437 mates being pulled back up and solved at the top level. So instead of 171 mates, we are solving around 400 mates. Okay. And I've seen this numerous times. Um, I saw a company do an aileron uh, with 73 flexible sub-assemblies. They had around 100 top-level mates. They are solving 1,500 top-level mates with all the flexible sub-assemblies. I uh, just recently had one last week, same thing. Uh, he had about 20 top-level mates, had about four sub-assemblies yet he was solving 2,000 mates at the top level. Okay, so definitely it impacts load times um, as well as overall performance. So we want to use flexible. Keep in, uh, it's a very, uh, very fun feature, very neat feature, very important feature. Um, but we want to use it as a diagnostics tool. Okay. So we know that there are certain positions we can put hard configurations to put the, to put the model in the correct uh, orientations. And then at some point, we want to turn on the flexible, go through the range of motion, make sure we didn't miss something um, that we're working on. But we don't want to stay and work in that flexible state. Import diagnostics. Uh, we deal with a lot of imported models, whether you're, you're getting them from the customer, whether you're getting them from the web. Okay, uh, these are these can be uh, uh, any host of file formats, including uh, IGES, Parasolid, Step. Um, these can be native files. We always want to run import diagnostics to heal up our geometry. Okay. Uh, so we found an imported file here. We open it up. 
And let's actually go take a look at this one real quick. All right, when I open this file, it comes in, right? It even comes in as a solid body, right? So everything uh, from the surface of this looks good, okay? If you're not prompted to run import diagnostics uh, when you open the file, uh, you can run it from the tree. The key is that we can't have any features in the tree. We just want the imported geometry. I'm going to right click, run my import diagnostics. SOLIDWORKS is going to do a check on the geometry. And in fact, this one does come back and shows that there are two bad faces. Okay. You can click on them. It'll highlight them. Okay. You can take a look. Right. That face is top face. Now, everything looks good. I don't see anything. But this could just be a, a, a tiny little gap uh, in the edge. Um, any number of things that we just can't see at the surface level. So I'm going to start by hitting the attempt to heal all. So when you have import geometry errors, these cause problems down the road. We find that these cause problems in simulation studies. Um, I've seen this cause problems in drawings uh, where you can't, uh, if you're in the model and can't attach uh, dimensions to a face, to an edge, um, we found that, that sometimes there's underlying geometry problems. All right, so we do need to get those. Uh, healed up, and the import diagnostics is an automated tool to help us out. So we look for that big green message, and this model is good to go. Okay, so continuing down this path, what we want to do is we want to remove unnecessary detail. The larger the assembly gets, the less detail I need to see. Okay. So things like a handle, I don't need to see the threads because that's going to be up against the drawer front. We're not going to see that internal geometry. This is one of our favorites that comes across quite often. Um, simple ball bearing file. Okay. So from the surface, it looks like a cylinder pretty good couple clues that give this one away. Uh, first thing that I do is I always show my solid bodies. Um, I set that folder to be shown. And the first place I look at is I see that I have 15 solid bodies. All right, that is a red flag. Okay, In an assembly, multi-body parts count as individual components. So this in an assembly counts as 15 components. So this increases my body count. Okay, so how do I clean this one up? A couple different things. We can take a look, because it's a ball bearing, and if we section this, it has all of the balls in there, in the raceway. Okay, so we can see that that is a circular pattern, so I can find uh, those components. I can find the first revolve, All right? So I could take those. We do right click, and we could do a delete bodies. All right? I can get rid of all that circular geometry. Spherical geometry is extremely high on graphic triangles, okay? Because you're trying to make that perfect sphere. But is that good enough? All right. It gets rid of the, the most uh, taxing uh, geometry. But we can do better. So again, I create my simplified configuration. And what I can do with this one is simply create an extrude. Okay. This one I drew on this recessed face. I'm keeping uh, preserving the exterior look of this part. And I offset a couple circles from the inside edge and from the outside edge. And I simply extrude that up to the recessed face on the back side. So when I do that, if I take a look at my cross section now, it creates a solid cylinder. So I keep the exterior look but I get rid of all that interior geometry 
And once again, all I'm doing is I want that placeholder. I want that spacing. This was the only component that I found in this particular uh, assembly uh, that contained a logo. Okay. Logos, extruded logos, um, contain a lot of detail. All right, so he's got a lot of small features in here. Again, increasing our trial counts. Being that this is inside a cabinet uh, that we don't get to see from the outside anyway, we're going to go ahead and clean this one up as well. Always going into my simplified configuration okay. to remove the logo. That one's uh, pretty easy. We're simply going to convert the outside edge. Right. So I create my sketch following that oval on the outside and just extrude through that one. Merge that together and we can get rid of the logo pretty easy. I can do the same thing with the uh, terminal labels here. Okay, I can I create a sketch, convert the circular edge, and we extrude right through those. Okay. But what if we have geometry where they've cut the text numbers in here? Okay, what if I want to preserve that information? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by creating a sketch on this face, and I'm going to convert the entities, convert the edges of all the geometry I want to keep. Then I'm going to delete the geometry. Get out of my sketch. I'm going to right click and under my face, I'm going to use my delete face command. I'm going to select all the faces that make up that geometry. I use the delete and patch feature. And if I have show preview on, I should get a little yellow highlight that it recognizes that geometry and I can remove that geometry. Again, this is an imported file, so I don't have that geometry that created that cut. So I go through and I remove all of that text. But I still have that sketch that preserves it. So to finish that up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split, use my split face command. And now I'm going to use that sketch to split one face into multiple faces. And in this case, I just colored the text black. But now I don't have any depth associated to that geometry. Another one where we find a lot of that is labels. Uh, labels, panels, okay. Um, very, very common uh, for people to go in and create these text, and then they all cut it in five foul uh, to create the uh, create the text. Okay, again, all that does, and especially on feature letters like S's and R's, it creates that curved geometry. Uh, those areas in particular have high uh, uh, triangle counts. All right, so lots of uh, lots of detail getting generated there. So a nice little trick here. Okay. Go into a uh, normal two view. Okay, so we look straight down at this. Um, I will usually turn off the shadows, turn off uh, uh, the background, put a white, nice white background in there, and I use a uh, screenshot. So I use a, a snippet. Uh, you can w use the Windows uh, uh, Snagit tool and take a screenshot.
And then I can come back in here and I can get rid of all this geometry. I can actually go a little bit further with this model. I can take all those uh, holes out of there. And what I would do is I would come over and use my decals. So I can go into my files. And I can apply that decal to the face. I get that same look without all the actual geometry. Okay, so we can play with the mapping. Uh, we can uncheck fit ratio. Right, and stretch this out properly. And that file is going to perform much cleaner because there is no geometry underneath. One tip there is if you go into your system options under your document properties, um, under model display, there is a checkbox that you can store your appearances and decals inside of the part file. That means you don't have an external link to that file. All right, so now we've gone through, we've cleaned up all our geometry, right? So now I can go back to my advanced opening options. So I can filter this up, find my assembly, and under configurations, I'm gonna go back to that advanced option. This last option that we didn't talk about says use a specified configuration for part files when available. Now, if we've done good and we've done a consistent naming convention, right? We named everything simplified and spelled it the same way. SolidWorks can then go find that configuration and stick it in our model. Once it's in there, you can save and update uh, the model with all those configurations. So we wanted to take a deep dive and really look at this. So now I've gone through, I'm showing you all these different things that help us clean up these models. How's that really impact and help us on performance? So what we did is we took these models and at the time um, we created this, um, I had a Dell M6800. Uh, we had a box uh, laptop, uh, which has a slightly faster CPU and we had a box Apex 2. And what this represents to us is basically one gigahertz increase in clock speed. Okay. Um, so it, using 2016 files, opening the files in 2017, um, we see that as we went up in clock speed, the opening time went down. So we current, converted the files to 2017, and again, we see the same thing. We saw performance increases. Comparing to the models into 2018, uh, we now are able to look at the 2016, 2017, and 2018 versions. All right. Again, as we went up in clock speed, consistently the opening times went down. Makes sense. Faster clock speed I have, the, the, the less opening time. Okay, so how do we really hammer the system? We, well, we wrote a macro, and we took all the image quality to the very lowest setting, all the image quality all the way to the maximum setting. And we ran our numbers. Okay, so as we expect, you get a nice long time. Um, but what we saw was that uh, 
2018 definitely gave us a benefit over 2017, right? So SolidWorks is, a, is helping us. They're improving their performance uh, every year as we go into newer versions. So what does that equate to? Increase in the clock speed one gigahertz in using the 2016 files gave us a 16% improvement. Using the 2017 percent, uh, 2017 files gave us a 26%. Using the 2018 files, converting everything up, cleaning up our geometry, we saw a 40% improvement in performance. So this, uh, the bottom line is, guys, I see this time and time and time again. And every time we go into these assemblies, it's the same thing. It's the stuff that we just went through. Helical springs, helical fasteners, ball bearings, extruded text. Those are all common parts that we see over and over and over again that just hammer performance. So if we can clean up that part, we can use a simplified configuration. That way you can have a full detailed view for drawings. But as the assemblies get bigger, as you see less of that, those components, the less detail you need to see. So performance is two-sided. There is the hardware improvements, and there are the model improvements. We pair the two improvements together, that's where we see our biggest leaps in overall performance.